Okay, so um, now that we know the relationship between temperature, entropy, and energy, I'll derive the uh, temperature of a large Einstein solid in the high temperature limit. So recall the definition of temperature, our theoretical definition of temperature. One over T equals partial derivative of S with respect to U, while number and volume are held constant. Okay, so uh, taking the uh, equation 2.46 from the last chapter, which gives us the entropy of a large Einstein solid in the high temperature limit. So S equals NK times the natural log of Q over N plus one. Okay. Now, remember that we had been starting off with the Einstein solace in uh, when we talked about the energy that it had, because it's the energy levels of the Einstein solid are quantized. We've been counting the number of quanta of energy, the number of units of energy. Q. But in the real world, what we really want to measure is U, capital U, which is energy measured in joules or electron volts or whatever. Okay, so since U equals QHF, where Planck's constant times the frequency, that little oscillator, the say the um, atom vibrating back and forth. HF is a unit of energy. We'll call that epsilon. And that's, uh, epsilon is often used in physics and in math as well to represent some small amount of something. And uh, here, it's convenient that it also is the letter E, which means energy. Okay. So epsilon equals HF, which is the energy of one quantum of energy, um, or just one quantum. Okay, so. Q is U over epsilon. All right, so what, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to replace Q with something involving our normal measure of energy, U. So I solved for Q. I can substitute that in here now. Now I'm going to expand this natural logarithm here. And multiply through by nk. Okay, 
So now I have an equation for the entropy of our Einstein solid, and I want to find the temperature. So I'm going to put S here into this formula uh, for temperature there. Let me scoot this over a bit. So remember, one of the temperature is ds by du, with n and v held constant. Make sure raise this up just a tad. So ds by du is going to be d all of that stuff by du. Now, if everything else is held constant except the, uh, uh, the entropy, then, well, we don't really have number. In, uh, no, wait, we do have number. We don't have volume when we're talking about this microscopic model of an Einstein solid, uh, but we do have the um, fundamental energy of one quantum, epsilon, which is, of course, a constant. And so the great thing is, well, this is, looks like a little bit of a mess right here. Derivative with respect to u, that's constant, that's constant, that's broken. And this is the only thing that changes, is that first term. So the other two terms go off to zero. Okay, so I can rewrite this very simply. Well, let's see. I've got a natural log of u here, so I'm taking d by du of some constant times the log of u. In K, multiplied by this, they can be pulled outside the derivative. And I've got D log of U over DU. What's the derivative of a natural log? What's the derivative of natural log of x? Yes, so we've got, just one over u. One over t equals nk over u. So t equals u over nk. Why don't I just solve for the energy at this point? And we come up with Einstein solid equals nkt. And what was, what did we learn from the equal partition theorem way back in chapter one or two? Well, anyway, a chapter or two ago, the equal partition theorem says th the theorem u equals n times number of degrees of freedom, it's lowercase f, over 2, kt. For each oscillator in an Einstein solid, remember that an atom is not the oscillator in an Einstein solid. An atom is connected to other atoms by those spring-like uh, atomic bonds, vertically, horizontally, and back and forth. Each one of those directions is a separate oscillator. So how many degrees of freedom does each oscillator, not each atom, but each oscillator have? Two. One quadratic degree of freedom is the kinetic energy as the atom moves back and forth like this. Um, remember, a quadratic degree of freedom has to have, has to have the energy proportional to either position squared or velocity squared. So, what have mv squared, so there's velocity squared. And another quadratic degree of freedom uh, for each oscillator is the potential energy. 
for the spring type uh, uh, bond, uh, which is one half k x squared, where k is the spring constant. Uh, so it's, it's quadratic with respect to the position. So f equals 2, put that in there, and we get u equals nkt. That's the same as that, and we have just managed to rewrite the energy of an Einstein solid at high temperature limit when, uh, from the, uh, our definition of temperature, knowing our model, we have to know the model of how, a, um, how an Einstein solid is constructed in order to get that formula we had for the entry. So we have to know the microscopic structure of this to begin with, and that's, and that's you know, that might be a problem in itself. But we didn't need to know the equal partition theorem once we had that in order to come up with the energy as a function of temperature. We came up with it from a different route. And we have more or less confirmed the equal partition theorem, which is nice. Which makes sense because the laws of physics have to be so consistent. So even looking at one thing from two different ways should get us the same answer unless we've made some mistake in the model. Okay, so that was nice. Um, what I will do next, okay, let's say for my next trick, let's find the temperature of an ideal gas. Uh, monatomic ideal gas. And why a monatomic ideal gas? Because it's easier. So, as before, recall that 1 over the temperature is partial of S with respect to U, while number of particles and volume of no constant. And I will take the um, uh, entropy from the Sackler Tetra equation. I'll take equation 2.49, which gave me the entropy equals, now let's see here. Nk log V. plus nk log of u to the 3 halves, plus some complicated annoying function of number. OK. I look at my formula for the temperature, and I put in our functional form for the entropy, right up there, and take the derivative with respect to u. So this ugly and annoying equation here, which has even one term that we really haven't even written out, <laughs> um, it can be done. It's just hideous. So how much of a problem is that going to cause us? Well, let's see. I'm taking the derivative of a function that has one, two, three additive terms. So that means I can add up their derivatives. I can split, I can distribute the derivative properly. Now let's see, for each one of these we call it n and v are constant. First term, there is no uh, energy inside that there. N and V are constant. That's zero. Second term, we do have a function of U in there, so I'll come back to that. 
The third term of the one that was really causing us a bit of worry, which is only that function of uh, unknown function of n, well, n is constant, that's also zero. And now we're down to the same term again. And one that's it's, uh, pretty simple, log of u to some power. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, I can take that log of u to the three halves is three halves times the log of u. So I can pull that down there and simplify this even before I take the derivative. So I'll have three halves in k times log of u. Well, three halves in k is constant times some function of u. I can pull the three halves in k outside the derivative. What's the log of u by du? 1 over u. 1 over u. If I want to solve for u, I cross multiply. Three halves in KT, which ought to sound really familiar because the equal partition theorem told us that for every degree of freedom we have one half KT, you know, um, uh, units of energy. And how many degrees of freedom does a monotonic ideal gas have? Three. three. X, Y, and Z axes. So three halves in KT. And so we've just shown that we get the same result as for the equal partition theorem for monatomic ideal gas two. <coughs> okay. Let's do section three point two on entropy and heat. And we're going to see how we can predict heat capacities from theory. Take a look back on page 28, equation 1.44. I think I should look at it too. capacity for constant volume, we were already given as partial derivative of u with respect to temperature, while volume is held constantly by definition of heat capacity constant volume. But here, we also want to specify that the number of particles is held constant. So I'm adding one extra constraint on this. Okay, now that we know how to get temperature and we've been able to solve for energy, we can start to use this. Uh, let's see here. So, if we take an Einstein solid in the high temperature limit, And remember what the high temperature limit is. When we introduce the Einstein solid, I don't even think we had temperature in the formula. What we were told was the high temperature limit was when the number of the quanta of energy was much greater than the number of oscillators. So if Q was much greater than N. In practice, what that means is that you have a lot more energy units than you have oscillators, which means on average, 
every oscillator is likely to have a number of quanta of energy contained within it. They can be moved around, but it's likely that all of your oscillators will have a good amount of energy in them. And uh, since temperature, we know at a fundamental level, is proportional to, well, from the equal partition theorem, uh, the uh, temperature uh, goes along with how much energy is divided up per oscillator, per particle, whatever, then this means it's in the high temperature. Okay, so Q is much greater than M. So, what's the heat capacity of a, high, of a hot Einstein solid? Take this uh, formula right here, Cv equals du by dt, the n and v constant. Put in our uh, equation for the energy of a hot Einstein solid. So that's U equals NKT, and simply plug that in. Uh, this came from equation 3.11. Okay, so N is constant. We don't have V involved in there at all. The only variable in here is t. n and k can be pulled outside the derivative, and we've got n k partial t with respect to t. And what is dt by dt? One. One, right. The heat capacity of a, an Einstein solid in the high temperature limit is simply in K, number of oscillators times K. That was easy. What about a monatomic ideal gas? Once again, we choose that one because it's a practical uh, one and it's easy to do, despite the fact that the Sackler Tetra equation is a little ugly. as much as I can do here. Let's see. That's better. <coughs> so, second example. Start off again. Definition of the heat capacity at constant volume. And U equals three halves in KT, which I've just derived, and that's according to I don't know what equation number that is. Okay. Substitute that in for U, take the derivative. Well, I'm not going to make it a belabor the point, but three halves in and K are definitely constant here. And so I've got those pulled outside the derivative. I'm left with dt by dt, which again is 1. And I come up with the heat capacity for a monatomic ideal gas is 3 times in k. So, procedure. When you need to find the heat capacity from theory like this, first, Use quantum mechanics and statistics, the combinatorics we go from, way back in chapter two there, to find the multiplicity, omega. You want to find it as a function of these macroscopic variables, u, n, v, etc., whatever, whatever applies in the case. This is going to be the tough step to derive a, fun a formula for the multiplicity as a function of your macroscopic variables. Okay, then. From the multiplicity, get the entropy. S equals n k log, sorry, S equals k log omega, k times the natural log of omega. That's the easy part. 
Then take the definition of temperature that we've been using for timber. Water for temperature is Vs by du, holding N and V constant, uh, in order to find temperature as a function of energy. Now that you've got temperature as a function of energy, turn it around and solve for energy. Find U, energy, as a function of temperature. Um, and it says, uh, you can take a look at chapter 6, coming up later, for an alternative way to get this step without knowing the entropy or working with multiplicity. And then finally, now that you have energy as a function of temperature, take the derivative with respect to temperature to find the heat capacity. Simple, except there are very few systems where we can derive the uh, multiplicity and therefore the uh, entropy from theory. And we've already done that. Or at least we've done the easy ones. Um, so we we'll stuck. Yeah, not so fast. Yet. Because, being scientists, we have laboratories and we can measure entropy in the lab without an explicit formula. So if we don't have a formula for the entropy of our system, we can measure it. All right, since one over temperature is dS by du, with n and v constant, equation 3.5, then let me solve for ds. Uh, notice, by the way, that I have... This is a, a subtle point in the mathematics. I've written this as a partial derivative because I'm explicitly saying that we need to hold the number and volume constant. Only S and U are changing here. Well, this partial derivative really tells me that these other variables are held constant. Now, if I want to multiply both sides by DU, okay, then I'm not sure how easily it is to justify the notation, but we don't really have that partial symbol anymore. It's just the, the normal differential symbol, regular uh, uh, D. And, but I am going to still specify we've got a constant volume here. Uh, of course, we've also got a constant number as well. So anyway, I just wanted to multiply through by du so I can, I can separate out ds. I want to solve for the entropy. First, that means I've got to get the differential of s by itself. It's a constant volume. Now, if it's a constant volume, then that, that means that the volume is not changing. If the volume is not changing, there is no mechanical work being done. Mechanical work requires expansions or compressions. Uh, and let's also uh, specify that there is no other work being done, like electrical work or other things like this.
So W equals zero. You divide out the first law. The first law tend to box in the equations that we should simply recall from earlier, useful fundamental ones. The first law, du equals q plus w. The change in the system's energy equals the heat added to it plus the work done on it. Now just specify, since we've got v constant, no mechanical work is being done, and for the moment I'll specify no other work is being done. So w is zero. Okay. Now, notice that I've got infinitesimal changes going on. An infinitesimal change in the energy. And so I'm also talking about infinitesimal change of, sorry, infinitesimal amounts of heat added in, infinitesimal changes in the uh, entry here. Now, the nice thing about that is, once I've got this here put in, Q and T are things that are easy to measure in the lab. And again, I'm specifying that V is constant, W in general is zero, and uh, number and any other macroscopic variables are also constant, even though they don't explicitly appear here. Okay. So this holds true for small changes in the entropy, for small amounts of heat added. Um, when you add a very small amount of heat in, you're not really changing the temperature appreciably. But we're going to find out also that this still holds true for macroscopic amounts of heat added, large amounts of heat added, and therefore macroscopic changes in the entropy as long as the temperature is constant while the heat is being added. An example of the temperature being constant while heat is added in is a phase change. If I put a block of ice on a stove, its temperature stays constant while it melts. While that heat's being added into it from the stove unit, the, uh, 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 the, the ice cannot get warmer than its melting temperature until it's completely melted. And this will still hold true then. Okay, what are the temperatures changing? If I'm not going through a phase change, then any large amount of heat added in is going to make a noticeable change in the temperature. So, if the temperature is changing, let's see here. then it's easier to use Okay, go back to du by t Easier I should raise this camera a little bit there we go ds is du by d, uh, b, uh, du by t so recall this from just a moment ago, and use the heat capacity at constant volume, which is du by dt. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve the heat capacity formula for du, and then I'm going to put that in here. Okay, so du, again, if I've got a partial derivative here, uh, let's see, you know, u, n and v are held constant here. If I've got a partial derivative, once I cross multiply, I multiply through by dt, I really can't write it as a partial anymore. I just write it as a total, a, uh, I write it as a differential, but I've got to specify that I'm holding these other things constant. CVDT. 
put that in in the, in the equation for uh, the change in the entropy. Tell the truth, that is a handy equation right there. Well, but still I want to measure, maybe I want to measure the, the large scale change here. I still get this written in terms of differentials. So what do I do to get S? Integrate. Integrate. So I integrate both sides. Now, the integral of ds, well, like the integral of dx, is just delta s here. You know, from my starting entropy to my final entropy there. So this becomes delta s, which means I'm looking at a macroscopic change now, something that can be easily measured. Now, here, I'm integrating instead of from s1 to s2, or s initial to s final, on this side, I've got it as a function of temperature. So I'm integrating from temperature initial to temperature final. So Ti to Tf. There we go. There. Fortunately, I crowded it up a little bit there, but delta S equals the integral from initial to final temperature of the heat capacity at constant volume over temperature dt. So what do I do with this here? If I can measure the heat capacity, or if I know it, uh, maybe it's, it's in a table somewhere, then I've really got all I need. And the really nice thing is, is that sometimes the heat capacity at constant volume, sometimes this heat capacity is more or less constant over some range of temperature, maybe from my initial to final temperature that I'm interested in. And if the heat capacity is, is pretty much constant over this range of temperature, you can pull it outside the integral. And when that's the case, um, you've just got the integral of dt over t, which is natural log of t. Other times, the temperatures that you're integrating it you know, between the, these limits off Maybe the heat capacity varies quite a bit, and you can't do that then. You might be able to do it numerically, or maybe you've got a formula for the heat capacity as a function of temperature, and then you can do it. Okay, let me give an example then. If we want to find how much the entropy increases as we heat up a cup of water. There's a cup of water. We'll have a mass of 200 grams. Let's say we're heating it up from uh, 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, by the way, of course, we're going to want to convert that into Kelvin, right? So 20 degrees Celsius is... How much do we add to it to get kilowatts? 273 plus 20 gives us 293 degrees Kelvin. Pretty close to our, our uh, common round number of 300 Kelvin for room temperature. Okay, and 
Let's heat it up right to the boiling temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. So we'll add in 273. Three seventy-three Kelvin. Okay. Now, if you want to look up the heat capacity, the problem is that heat capacity, capital C, depends on how much of the substance you've got. So you're not going to be able to look up um, that capital C for a cup of water because it depends on how much water you've got in the cup. But remember that we have the specific heat capacity, lowercase c, which is, let's see here, heat capacity is specific heat times the mass. And you look up the specific heat, again, I always try to put a serif on the capital C because you can't always tell whether it's capital or lowercase in handwriting. Lowercase c here. And I guess I haven't been consistent with that before. All right, starting now for sure. This is lowercase c. Specific heat capacity is 4.18 joules per gram degree Kelvin. That's a capital K. Now, why is it in grant per joules per gram degree Kelvin? Because we're mixing up our meters, kilograms, seconds, normal uh, uh, form of the metric system. Here I've got something that's an MKS unit, and here I've got something which is a CGS unit, the gram centimeter, gram centimeter uh, second, just not a unit. Um, well, because this is commonly put on there, it's uh, one of the reasons why I didn't convert the mass into kilograms, because it's common enough to find it in this odd mixed form here. Anyway, these are in the tables. <clears throat> okay. So now let's see. I've got this mass initial final temperature. Um, looks like I can integrate and find what I want. There is my equation for the uh, change in the entropy. Capital CV is lowercase CV times the mass, and both of those are constant over the, well, the mass is constant, and lowercase uh, CV, specific heat, is also pretty much constant over this range of temperatures. And it's good to check, look that up and confirm. Okay. So I can pull those outside here. Now I've got the integral of dt over t, which is the natural log of t. Now, it's the natural log of t evaluated from final minus natural log of t initial. Natural log of final t minus natural log of initial t is the natural log of t final divided by t initial, which is more convenient. All right, now I just plug and chug here. Cv is 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin times the mass, which is 200 grams times the natural log of 373 over 293. I'm about to run out more here. Of course, the degrees, Kelvin, cancel out here, which is good, because you can't take the natural log of something that has units. This is unitless, and it works out just fine. Okay. Uh, notice again, if I had put this in in Celsius, I would have had a different answer, because Celsius is shifted. It's not scaled differently from Kelvin. It's shifted. The zero point is shifted. 
And so the ratio of these two temperatures is not the same in Celsius as it is in Kelvin. There is the uh, Rankine temperature scale, which is a uh, thermodynamic temperature uh, based on has absolute zero, is zero degrees Rankine, but the degree sizes are the size of a Fahrenheit degree. That would work perfectly well here, because degrees Rankine would cancel out with degrees Rankine down there. And the ratio of those would be the same as the ratio of two degrees of uh, different temperatures in Kelvin. But I couldn't use Fahrenheit because, again, the zero point is shifted. Imagine if you had a temperature difference of 10 degrees uh, Celsius or Kelvin. Well, it makes a difference whether the, the difference of 10 degrees, if it starts at 300 and goes to 310 Kelvin, or if it starts at zero and goes to 10 degrees Kelvin. The ratio is going to be quite different. So that's why we've got to uh, convert into an absolute temperature scale. All right, anyway, natural log of that times that times that. And I come up with a change in entropy is 202, let's see, grams cancel joules per degree Kelvin. Now, you see, I don't know what the actual entropy is when I'm done, but I know that it's got 202 joules per Kelvin more than it started off with. So, you might wonder, how could we find the actual amount of entropy? And that's a good thing to wonder. What we would do to find the actual total entropy held by an object is to take this formula that we've got, delta S is the integral of CV over T, dt, and integrate it all the way from zero degrees Kelvin up to whatever temperature it is. gets us to the third law of thermodynamics. You see, the formula here, oh, let's see. heat capacity, constant volume, might be roughly constant over whatever range of temperatures, especially a small range of temperatures that you might be interested in. But if you're going all the way down to absolute zero, I can guarantee you that this is going to change. So, you do need to know either numerically or some functional form of the heat capacity as a function of temperature. So, if you know the, how this varies with temperature as the temperature approaches absolute zero, then you take this uh, equation that we had before, integrate from initial to final temperature, well, this is the general form. And now I'm specifying that this is a function of temperature too, so I can't pull it outside the uh, interval. Now, if I set my 
initial temperature, my low end temperature, would be zero. So let's see, this is delta S is delta at T final minus delta, sorry, delta S is S at T final minus S at T initial. So S at whatever temperature, you know, room temperature, whatever you've got it ending up in, minus the entropy at absolute zero. equals the interval from temperature at absolute zero to T. Okay, so let me solve for, this is the total entropy your system has at the temperature you're looking at there. So let me add this to both sides. Looks like temperature equals okay. Zero degrees Kelvin. I'll put in a little degrees in there to make it clear. Well, what's going to happen? Think of this CV over T. This is a function here. As I, I'm integrating this function from zero up to whatever temperature. What happens to this function here as the temperature approaches zero? It blows up to infinity, which is bad. <laughs> so we can't integrate. It would not be integrable if that were the case. If the, the integral would blow up if the function blows up there. So that would mean that everything if that were the case, that would mean that everything had this infinite amount of entropy to it. Oh, that would be kind of meaningless there. So we can conclude that um, to keep that this does that, that doesn't actually happen, which means that the numerator, the heat capacity, must also go approach zero as the temperature goes down to zero. So we can conclude that the numerator is also zero when we get down to zero degrees, if it achieves that in the limit. So to keep that from blowing up as temperature approaches zero, we have to have the heat capacity approach zero even faster than T approaches zero. And that will keep it finite. So the third law can be stated as heat capacity at constant volume approaches zero as the temperature approaches zero. So recall, the first law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy. DU equals Q plus W. The second law of thermodynamics uh, deals with the entropy of systems work under, unless they're interfered, interfered with from the outside, uh, their entropy will naturally stay the same or increase, and under any not, um, any irreversible process, it will increase. Often paraphrased as things go from bad to worse. The third law tells us that the heat capacity must vanish at absolute zero. Okay, uh, and I'll have it just uh, some verbal notes on this, and that'll be the end of this section here. The, all right. Also, what is the entropy of a system at absolute zero? I'm reading pretty much from the book here. 
In principle, this entropy is also zero. At zero degrees Kelvin, the system should settle into its unique lowest entropy state. Uh, sorry, its unique lowest energy state. So if the temperature is zero, the system should have should be in its ground state energy, the least energy it can possibly get into. Might not be that the energy is zero, but it's got only one way of arranging itself, and that gives you a uh, multiplicity of one. Take the natural log of one, which is the entropy, you get zero. Uh, just as an example here, let's say I'm looking at the system is this piece of chalk. All right? When it's got its lowest amount of, or when it's got its lowest temperature at absolute zero, it better not be bouncing around. So it's got to have its lowest amount of energy, zero kinetic energy, and zero potential energy. And it's going to settle into, it's not going to be balanced on the edge of one of those groups, it'll be down in the ball, where the potential energy is the lowest. Okay. And if it's got no temperature, it's not going to be wiggling around in there where it might pop out of that. It's settled into, crystallized in place in that lowest energy state. That's another statement of the third law of thermodynamics. This is sort of the technical part here, but as far as more intuitive meaning, this goes along with it as well. But in practice, you might have some reasons why the entropy is not zero at absolute zero temperature. And he says it more importantly, it, most importantly, in some crystals, it's possible to change the orientation of the molecules with very little change in energy. For example, water molecules can orient themselves in several possible ways within an ice crystal. Technically, one particular arrangement will always have a lower energy than any other. So we should still think that this goes down to zero. But in practice, the arrangements are often random or nearly so. And you would have to wait eons, you know, maybe more than the age of the universe, to find the crystal randomly rearrange itself into the true lowest energy state, the true ground state. So in practice, what this means is that at absolute zero, or as close as you can ever imagine getting to it, the solid can have some frozen in what's called residual entropy that it can't in any reasonable length of time, and reasonable still might mean millions of years, that it cannot get lower than. That's the residual entropy. Uh, when it still has a little bit of extra energy, it could go to a lower energy state. Um, another form of residual entropy comes from mixing different nuclear isotopes of an element. So uh, atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons. Most elements have more than one stable isotope. Remember, an unstable isotope is radioactive. It can decay into something else. Um, and there are, you can have uh, some elements, you can have a few more neutrons or a, few, a little bit fewer neutrons that are still stable and are not going to radioactively decay. In natural systems, these are mixed together kind of randomly, and there's an associated entropy of mixing, just like mixing two gases we did before. At absolute zero, there should be a unique lowest energy state where the isotopes are unmixed or distributed in an orderly way. But in practice, they're almost always stuck at random places in the crystal mass. He makes a note that helium is an exception. It's liquid at absolute zero, which is particularly cool. And it allows the um, helium-3 and helium-4 isotopes to arrange themselves in an orderly way. Helium can also be a superfluid, which is also new. And a third kind of residual entropy at absolute zero when you have different alignments of the nuclear spins. So your nucleus has your protons and neutrons, and they have spins, and their quantum mechanical spins can line up one way or another. At temperature zero, the entropy does disappear as the spins will align themselves parallel or anti-parallel to their neighbors. So you've got, if you've got proton and the neutron here, or even just the um, two atoms in the lattice. One has spin up, the other has spin up, that's parallel. Spin up and spin down is anti-parallel. Well, if they're parallel, they want to, uh, let me see, uh, they usually want to align themselves, I think, is the lowest energy. 
or no, 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 I think I want to be anti-line. Let me see here. I've got to see whether he means the, yeah. But you've got to get way, way down below even one degree Kelvin for them to start lining up in this way here. Usually they've got a bit of random alignment to them. Okay. And that's pretty much it. So, in the next class, we'll take a look at macroscopic views of entropy, and then we'll do paramagnetism, which is one of those interesting systems that turns out to have possibility of negative absolute temperature.